Chapter 6 House Fire in Progress, 2545 Arthur Street The voice cracked over the speaker above the break room table Tuesday night as the alarms sprang to life, and instantly Jeff was on his feet. The whirlwind banked into high gear around him as people scrambled for the trucks. In the next blink, six of them were crammed into one, pulling on gear and equipment as they wailed their way to Arthur Street. The insides of Jeff's stomach flitted in no definite pattern as he pulled on his air tank. This was it, the one he had worked for, trained for, wanted to do, and suddenly the moment was upon him. Only the streetlights lit the night surrounding them as they sped to their destination, where in rapid succession they jumped out. Flames illuminated the night sky, jumping out of the second story of the house and reaching for the roof of the house ten feet over. Teague and Jackson, cut the utilities, Captain Rainier, the B-shift crew chief said as the truck slid to a stop. Jameson, you and Taylor get the vent holes cut. When his feet hit the street, Jeff grabbed the extension ladder and started for the house. In seconds, Zack Jameson was there climbing up with a roof ladder and chainsaw in hand. As soon as the saw was whirring, Jeff turned back for the truck, feeding one of the cotton hoses from the top of the truck down to Jackson, who had just returned. The training kicked in. His hands just worked, pulling the hose as it fed off the truck. At that moment, a frantic lady dressed only in a thin, flowery robe ran smack into the chaos and right up to Jeff's side. Caleb, did they get Caleb out? She asked, pulling on the edge of Jeff's coat as he fought to extract the last of the hose from the truck. When he turned, those eyes seemed terribly familiar. Fear. Utter, inconsolable terror. Who's Caleb? he asked, even as he worked. The hose hit the end. That's it. He's the little boy. He's eight. He's about so high with red hair and freckles. Where was he supposed to be? Jeff asked, trying to pay attention to everything at once. He was staying home tonight, by himself, while his mom and dad went out. They asked me to watch him. I didn't know anything until I heard the... Captain, we've got a problem. Jeff said, striding right up to where Gabe and the captain were strategizing where to go from here. Rainier looked up. What's that? There might be a kid inside. Might be? I didn't know. He said he was going to bed, the lady said as hysteria invaded her body and soul. Where's his room? Rainier asked. It's on the first floor in the back, the lady said. He just called me 30 minutes ago and everything was fine. Jeff looked at the captain, who yelled to two other firefighters running by. When they ran up, the captain briefed them and broke them into two groups. Gabe and Jeff would go around back. The other two would go in the front. Six words of final instructions before Jeff ran to the truck, where he grabbed the pry bar as Gabe pulled off an axe. The two of them raced down the darkened side of the house. At the gate, Gabe stopped, rattling the whole fence in his frantic attempt to get in. It's locked. Great. Jeff's brain sped ahead of him like a race car. Here. He dumped the metal at Gabe's feet, jumped onto the house's cooling system, which stood by the gate. Two short motions, and he was over. Pitch me the stuff. The equipment landed on the other side of the fence in a non-discernible pattern, and his hands moved in rapid succession, retrieving all of it, just as Gabe joined him on that side of the fence. They ran for the house, and at the first window, Jeff pounded on the glass. Hey, anybody in there? Caleb, anybody? The only answer was the popping of the flames high above them. At that moment, he heard the crash and ran to where Gabe had just hacked through the plate glass back door. He reached in as the smoke poured out of the gaping hole. One click, and they were in. The glass crunched under his boot as Jeff stepped through the opening, and the middle of his heart slammed into his chest. Caleb. A scared little eight-year-old kid in a two-story maze that he had no map for. Where was that little boy? Jeff pulled on his air mask as the smoke enveloped him. It was blinding, and he bumped into a dining room chair which sent him crashing into the wall. There were so many places a little kid could be. Feeling his way through the darkness lit only by the pathetic flashlight he swung this way and that, Jeff slid down the wall until it suddenly broke into a hallway and he turned into the opening. Caleb, Caleb, buddy, where are you? 
Nothing was quiet. Voices, water, fire, sirens, windows shattering from the heat, trying to find its way out. Then he saw what looked like a white cloth heaped next to the wall. I found him, he called to anyone who could hear anything in the melee. Gently, he picked up the little body, which felt like it weighed nothing at all. He met Gabe coming from the other direction, and they hit the opening together. Get out, get out, Gabe yelled, as if Jeff had any intention of hanging around for the rest of the show. Snaps and a crack. The fire was eating the second floor away right above them. It wasn't really running so much as just stepping cautiously as he fought through the smoke to find his way back out into the cool night. It's this way. Gabe grabbed his elbow and dragged him back into the dining room. Hurry! Crunch went the glass under his boot as Jeff became part of the smoke pouring out into the backyard. The streetlight beam gave him the first real look at what felt like a rag doll in his arms. Barely eight, the freckles stood out in stark contrast to the pale face. Oh God, please. A wail not wholly like a fire truck sliced through the night. Let's get him out front, Gabe said at the gate, which gave way with the first axe hit on the metal. Jeff's legs were hurrying through the darkness, but he didn't really feel anything as they broke past the trees on the edge of the house and into the swirl of lights flashing across the houses, making them look like a fun house gone mad. In a blink, he saw the EMTs rushing up the grass. Over here, he called, skidding to a stop on the grass and laying the little limp body in front of him. We've got it, one of the EMTs pushed him away, and Jeff backed up enough to let the team take the lead. Hey, you okay? Gabe asked with a clap on his back. He coughed twice. Yeah. He's breathing, one of the paramedics said as they all jumped into motion. It was only when the youngest one stood to get the stretcher from the ambulance that Jeff recognized him. That flash, and then he was gone. Teague, Taylor, the captain yelled. We need you guys ready to go in. A small look back, and Jeff turned. There was more work to be done. The clock in the locker room read 4.15 when he stumbled back in, his fellow firefighters surrounding him, sooty and grime-covered. They all looked like they had just come home from an all-nighter in hell. I hope the kid's going to be okay. Gabe said, pulling off his boots slowly as the sound of the showers hazed out the comment. Yeah. Jeff reached into his locker for the little gold cross. He needed it right now. Pulling its strength into his soul, he ran a hand over it and then yanked it on over his head. They weren't supposed to wear things like that at work, but he needed something. You did good out there, Taylor, Gabe said as Jeff stood on his way to the showers. Just doing my job. Well, I'd be happy to help you do it any day of the week. With a smile, Jeff reached out and caught Gabe's hand on the way forward. Watch what you wish for. Lisa noticed the picture of the gutted house on the front page of the Chronicle the next morning, and her interest riveted to the story. Midnight on a Tuesday. Sunday flitted through her mind, but after that... Her hand flipped through the paper, but there was nothing about him. Not that she really expected there to be. It was crazy to even think about him but the center of her heart hoped fervently that he was at home in bed when that one happened. Of course, she knew even if he was, he wouldn't be forever. Eventually, the law of averages would put him in one of those burning buildings. Eventually. She folded the paper and laid it to the side. Work was what was important now. Work. Jeff and all the other guys in the world would have to take care of themselves. She certainly didn't need to be wasting valuable energy stores on keeping up with them. Ten to one, the Celtics make it to the finals, Dante said from the top of the truck as Jeff worked below, restocking the first aid kits on Thursday. You and the Celtics, Hunter said as a road cone from the top of the truck landed on the concrete behind Jeff. Why don't you get a real team? Like who? The awesome Nets? Dante walked past Jeff to the truck door. Please, they can't even spell basketball, much less play it. Oh, yeah, like the Celtics all have PhDs, Hunter shot back as another road cone hit the ground behind Jeff. Hey, 
Would you quit throwing those down? Dante yelled. You're going to break something important. Like what? Hunter asked. My head for one, Jeff said, looking up at the man standing far above him like a supernatural cowboy. No, Dante ducked back out of the truck. I said important. Jeff shook his head and buried it in the first aid compartment. Why did he even try? Lisa, the voice said at her doorway as she sat in her office Friday evening, clicking through the internet looking for a good picture of a zebra that they could use. She looked up and came to immediate attention. Tucker? Yeah, sorry to disturb you. He opened the door wider and stepped in. Sherry said it was okay. Oh, Lisa fought to rebalance her world. Come in, have a seat. Her hands went to work straightening her desk. Sherry knew better, but Lisa also knew her secretary had a huge crush on Tucker and his all-American blonde good looks. One little please, and Sherry would have dove off a cliff for him. What can I do for you? I brought over this list of venues. Tucker held them up after he sat down. Grandpa thought we'd better get something booked before all the space is gone. Oh, okay. She reached for them. Let me see. However, he pulled them back. What do you say we do this over some dinner? It's almost six, and you have to eat anyway. Dinner? I'm kind of busy right now. She glanced at the zebra on her screen and wished she could join him in that nice green grass. Can't we just go over them here? I made reservations at La Tour d'Argent. D'Argent? Over on the bayou? She asked, sensing a trap. Why would you do that? Because you have to eat, and I have to eat, and we can talk while we eat. He looked at his watch, and all Lisa could think was that she would really like to break that perfectly straight nose of his. We've got to get, though, or we're going to be late. Late? How about never? Pushing all the protests of her rational side down, she stood. Let's get this over with so I can get back to work. Quickly, she grabbed her purse and made sure her money was in it. When she got to the door, she felt his hand guide her through it, and every fiber in her body wanted to smack it away. Sherry, I'm going to take off. Lisa readjusted her purse on her shoulder, and she didn't miss the dreamy look her secretary wafted over the two of them. Just lay the calls I need to return on my desk. Sure, boss, no problem. And that dreamy gaze followed them right out the door. At the elevator, Tucker reached past her and pushed the button. They stepped on, and he pushed too. My car's on the third, she said, and when he didn't reach for the button, she did, but he stopped her hand with his. Let's just take mine, he said, and she hated that tone. That way we can talk on the way. And get this over faster? That would be a blessing. Wishing it wasn't so hard to ignore the slithery way his gaze slid down across her, she stepped out into the parking garage. The second level. It was where she used to park until she hadn't been able to find a space that one day. Now, when she pulled into the garage, she told herself that parking on the third gave her a reason to take the stairs, which had to qualify for some exercise. However, the real reason was always right there in the shadows of her heart. They stopped at the new two-tone beige Lexus, and Tucker opened her door first. Smoothly, he took her hand as she folded onto the leather seats. As soon as she was in, she pulled her hand from the fingers that felt like they had been soaked in butter for two solid decades. When he shut the door, she sat back, pulling herself straight up as she did. Professional. Keep this professional, and he won't get any ideas. Quickly, she grabbed the seatbelt and wrapped it around herself. One more barrier, one more line of defense. His smile brought out the alarms in her spirit when he got in on the other side. He backed out, squealed the tires once, and they were off. The whole ride, Lisa kept her gaze trained out the window and her hands wrapped around the edge of her purse. When he turned on the stereo to slow, hold-me-tight music, she tapped her fingers over the purse, trying to make time run just a little faster. At the restaurant, Tucker let the attendant park the car. They were three steps up to the restaurant when Lisa noticed he had no notes in his hands. I thought we were going to talk business. 
He looked at her and smiled in that infuriating way that said she really should stop thinking so much and just let him lead. We'll talk business later. Then what are we going to talk about now? But she didn't have time to ask that question as Tucker was already conversing with a Mater D. Lisa clutched her purse tighter. Why was it that no matter what she said, guys just wouldn't take a hint? Right this way, the Mater D said leading them up a short set of stairs to a table at the far end of the restaurant overlooking the shimmering blue water of the gulf beyond. Perfect, Tucker said, and Lisa saw the bills pass from one hand to the other. Purposefully, she sat down, grabbed the menu, and perused it. The only thought going through her head was that this one dinner might bankrupt her entire company. A moment more, and Tucker joined her. I'm surprised you didn't have plans. Plans? she asked. I was working, if that's what you mean. No, I mean plans, you know, with friends or something. I had enough fun last week to last me a while, she said sourly. The shrimp looks good. He wasn't even looking at his menu. Instead, he looked like he was trying out for some modeling job for Oscar de la Renta. That suit just screamed, do you know how much money I have? It annoyed her to the nth degree. I'm sure glad Grandpa decided to go with your little firm. I just knew this was going to work out so well. In fact, I've been trying to talk the old man into letting me run with this. Well, with your help, of course. Hmm, that's nice, she said, barely listening. I wonder if the swordfish is fresh. I was really excited about it until he came up with his ridiculous public servant angle. I mean, what can the kids learn from the blue collar set about leadership? It's almost laughable. Lisa's gaze jumped to his as a serrated remark crossed her mind. However, the waiter picked that moment to approach their table. They ordered, and Lisa seriously considered grabbing onto the guy's leg and begging him not to leave them alone. However, she discounted that plan because something said that might invite more trouble than it would thwart. It's such a beautiful evening, Tucker said, gazing out across the gulf as he took a small sip of water. Then he turned liquid eyes on her. Almost as beautiful as you are. Well, that's original. So, we were going to go over the venues? He brushed that idea away with a swipe. Maybe later. How about we just get to know each other a little better? She started to protest, but he didn't give her a chance. I bet you didn't know I graduated from Yale, he said, taking the words right out of her mouth. Second in my class. Did my grandfather mention that? Um, no, I don't think so. The waiter returned with two glasses of wine, and as Lisa looked at it, she wondered how fast she would have to drink one glass of wine to make her drunk enough to get through a nightmare like this one. Yeah, Tucker continued without even acknowledging the waiter. And at the rate I'm going, I'll probably take over Cordell Enterprises by the time I'm thirty. How nice for you, she said, taking another drink. I had offers lined up at the door when I graduated, Tucker said. But I said, no, I want to stay with a family business. Loyalty, you know. People see that, and they know I've got things figured out. With one solid knock, Lisa's head started pounding. What she wouldn't have given for a loud, chaotic club where conversation was futile. And what she wouldn't give to have the guts to just stand up, call herself a cab, and tell Cordell Enterprises and Tucker himself to go jump off the highest cliff they could find. Instead, she forced a smile, telling herself that if it just got no worse than this, she could deal with it. When Jeff unlocked his door on Friday evening, he set the two bags of groceries on the little table. His fingers reached into his pocket and pulled out the little car that had spent the last week there. Slowly, he turned it over as he slipped the coat off his shoulders. Calling her was crazy. How many ways could a person say, I am not interested, leave me alone. However, as clear as that was to his head, his heart just wasn't getting the message. Somehow, he had hoped she would show up yesterday. Why, he didn't know. It was just that now she and Thursday were somehow intertwined in his head. Nonetheless, she hadn't, and so here he was. 
He picked up the phone, held it for a moment, and then dialed his second choice. Maybe if he just talked to somebody who had some sanity left, that would help him forget about her. In a heap, he slumped onto the bar stool next to the wall. Dustin, hey man. Jeffrey, long time no speak. What's up? Not much, Jeff said as his fingers turned the card over. How's work? Big station, lots of names, great fun. You? About the same. Jeff leaned back against the corner of the wall. How's Eve? Burning supper, again, Dustin said with a laugh. Hey, the voice in the background protested. I heard that. It's okay, I didn't marry her for her cooking skills, Dustin said, and Jeff heard her muffled voice. A twang jumped into his heart as the card flipped over his fingers and onto the counter. No, she's cool, but she wants to know if you ever got up the guts to go over to Travis. Air failed. No words would come. Hey, Jeff, you still there? Dustin asked after a moment. Yeah, I'm here. So, did you go? No, well, not exactly, but we kind of bumped into each other the other day. Fate, cool. Tell me more. Not much to tell. She gave me her card. And you called her? Well, no. Jeffrey, bud, this bumping into each other thing is cool and all, but you're going to miss this train if you don't get it in gear. He got the number. Okay, a number. Why wasn't that enough? I just don't want her to think I'm like... Interested? You are interested. So what's the problem? I don't know. His head hit the wall behind him three times. Just call her, Dustin said gently. I'm sure she'll be happy to hear from you unless she's completely dense. Call her. Jeff finally sighed and looked down at the little card. Okay, I'll call her. Putting her hand on the table was a mistake. Lisa had gotten that message loud and clear. It was like Tucker's buttery hand was a magnet for the top of hers. She had pulled hers back so many times by the time the entrees arrived, she thought she might get a repetitive motion injury. And Dad just thinks this is such a wonderful opportunity. Tucker droned on until Lisa's brain had to find something else to think about, lest she go insane. I do too, of course. I mean, who wouldn't? Great company, fabulous pay. The gold cross shining against the black backdrop of muscles and t-shirt floated through her mind, followed in the next heartbeat by that denim and suede jacket. It was so low-key, and yet so completely breathtaking. To be honest, she wasn't sure if it was the jacket or the layers underneath that intrigued her so much. That arm exuding strength caught her attention, and she wondered how many hours someone would have to spend in the gym to get arms like that. So, how about it? Tucker asked when the dessert dishes were cleared. Lisa? Oh, yeah. She shook the dream away from her. Okay. It was a good cover until she saw the Colgate smile that was in front of her rather than the lopsided one in her memories. Great, then let's go, Tucker said as he took her hand to help her out of the chair. Go? Where? The middle of her being asked, just as a layer down, something said. Never let them take you to the second crime scene. She was really going to have to lay off the wine and those deadly fantasies. Hi, Lisa, Jeff said, praying his voice would make it through this message. Leaving a message for her at work? Not a good idea, and yet he had made it this far. He wasn't going to turn back now. This, this is Jeff, from the fire station. Um, I thought you might still be at work, but I guess not. Well, I just wanted to call and say hi and ask how your week went, but, um, if you get this sometime, my number is 555-8696. You can call any time. I guess take care, and maybe I'll try to catch you some other time. Bye. His hand hung up the phone, and he collapsed headfirst into the couch. That had to be the worst phone message in the whole history of phone messages. Pushing himself up from the couch, he walked to the back of the apartment to the weight bench sitting in his bedroom. Yanking one barbell laden with weights up from its perch, he sat down on the bench and curved his arm to pull the barbell to him once, twice, 
three times. She wouldn't call back, that much was for sure. Four, five, six, and why would she? He wouldn't. Ten, eleven, twelve. In fits, his brain showed him pictures that he really didn't want to see. Fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Why did her smile have to make the top of his chest feel like it might explode at any moment? Twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two. One look should have told him he didn't have a chance with her. She was beautiful, gorgeous, the kind of girl who walks into a room and heads turn. Not like him. No, when he walked into a room, no one even noticed. Forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven. Not that he cared whether they noticed or not. It wasn't them he wanted to notice anyway. Just one of them, and he would be happy. At seventy-five, he switched hands. Dustin could do this. Lisa would have fallen into his arms in a heartbeat. Craig could have made it work. At least he would have gotten more than her work number. Thirty-eight, thirty-nine. And Ramsey? Ramsey would have already forgotten her name by now. He didn't want to be like that. Just a tenth of that. Yeah, a tenth would be good. Sixty-seven, sixty-eight, sixty-nine. But no, he had to be Jeff. Good old, holding the table down, Jeff. He put the weight down as he laughed sarcastically at that thought. Curling his toes under the bar at the opposite side of the bench, he let his back lay off of the support, down, down, until the middle of his stomach screamed for mercy. Defiantly, he pulled forward. Lisa was a nice dream, but she wasn't destined for him. He let himself slowly back down. No, she was destined for somebody who knew the difference in years and makes of wine. He pulled up. And how many forks are supposed to go on a table? And which one to use with what? His body arched down. And the proper attire to wear for a Sunday luncheon with a mayor? Up. He had no chance with her. Down. And the sooner he got that through his head to his heart, the better. This, um, this wasn't what I had in mind, Lisa said when Tucker's car turned up the street to the bar Houston. I'm really not into dancing. Just a little. Tucker put his hand a quarter inch from where hers laid on her lap to take the edge off. But I need to... Shh. He laid a finger to her lips, and what she really wanted to do was bite it off. I've got a friend who works here. He said he could get us in, no problem. Funny, she thought as she slumped back into her seat. He had told everyone about what he obviously thought was a date, except the one person on it with him. Had it not been for Burke and the account, she would have jumped out of the car, moving or not. When they pulled up to the club, alarm bells jangled through her spirit. Before he could get around the car, Lisa opened her door and stood. She might not have much choice, but the last thing she was going to do was give him an inch of a chance to think this was going anywhere. At the door, Tucker made a production of summoning his friend, who indeed let them right in. Her brain searched frantically for some way out. However, it kept running right into Burke. At a booth, Tucker stopped. How about here? Anything but a booth, she thought tiredly but she shrugged and slid in anyway. It took only seconds to realize what a huge mistake that was when Tucker arched one arm across the back of the booth while the other searched in the darkness under the table for her hand. You know, she said in panicked retreat, I've got to visit the ladies' room. She slid out the other side and fled for the back before he had a chance to protest. Once there, a plan formulated in her head, and she checked her watch. 10.30. Terrific. Carefully, she sat down by a wall and pulled out her cell phone. Of course, there was no one to call, but the other restroom occupants didn't have to know that. Hi, yeah, yeah, we just got here. Are you guys coming? Soup. Jeff was too depressed to eat anything else. He had already checked the machine six times, and still nothing. Just like he knew there would be, infinitely. The night was one long, exhausting merry-go-round of trips to the bathroom and fighting Tucker off when he tried to dance with her. Hands. He was all hands. 
They would slide up and down her back as they danced, and Lisa wondered what the feasibility of simply decking him and being done with it was. You know, she finally said, pulling back from him, fighting for air, I'm getting kind of tired. Why don't we call it a night? Good idea. You idiot, her brain yelled at her a mere 15 minutes later. The office is not this direction. This is kind of the long way around, don't you think? She asked, willing herself not to lose her cool. Relax, Tucker flashed that smile that ate away at her gut. I thought we could have a nightcap at my place. She closed her eyes, knowing Polite was going to get her in the middle of a wrestling match she had been a participant in one too many times. Look, I'm really tired. I need to go back and get my car. Hard to get. He put his hand on her shoulder and dug into the hardened muscles there. I like that. No. She took his hand and put it back on the steering wheel. Not hard to get. No get. Now, take me back to my car. He glanced over at her and scowled. But it's all the way across town. So? So let's just go to my place. You can crash there, and we'll get your car tomorrow. No, Tucker, you're not hearing me. I want to go to my car. Now, either you take me there, or I'm going to get out and walk. Her gaze chanced out to the freeway speeding by her window. Yeah, right, he said with a dismissive laugh, like you're going to jump out going 80 on the freeway. Lisa reached for the door handle. I'm not kidding, Tucker. He glanced over at her, and his face fell into a deeper scowl. But I bought you dinner. Money? She understood his insinuation and dug into her purse. Is that what you're worried about? Then here, here's forty. That should cover mine. She pushed the bills into his space as he glanced down at them without moving more than his eyes. Put your money back. It was on me. No she said as her patient snapped. On me means you don't expect anything in return. Nothing. Otherwise, it's not on you. It's on me. And that's not how this is going to go. So here, take this. She tried to stuff the bills into his jacket pocket, but he pushed her away. We're almost there, Tucker said as his voice darkened. He pulled off the freeway and stopped at an intersection. Just chill, okay? but she knew all too well where chilling was going to get her. With no more than a half a second of thought, she reached for the door handle, clicked it, and swung it open as the light turned green ahead of them. What are you doing? He practically screamed. What I should have done when you showed up. One hand clicked her seatbelt as her first heel hit the pavement. Horns behind them blared to life. Her body out, she slammed the door and stumbled from the middle of the road across three lanes to the other side as the cars played pinball with her path. Cripes, how do I let myself get into these messes? Beep, honk, beep, and she made it safely to the other side of the street. Great, now what? She looked around to get her bearings, and then she realized that Tucker might actually have the audacity to come try to find her. That thought jerked her steps down the street. I truly hate guys, she said into the night air. I really and truly do. They are nothing but egomaniacal, selfish, inconsiderate jerks. And if I never see another one again, it will be too soon. This has been To Protect and Serve, Volume 1 of the Courage series. Written by Stacy Stallings, narrated by Becky Dowdy, copyright 2012 by Stacy Stallings, production copyright 2014 by Stacy Stallings. This has been a Braveheart Audiobooks production. What's coming next? Find out. Like and subscribe to the Stacy Stallings YouTube channel, and never miss a second of the story.